You are in for a treat. Carl Goldman with you here on your hometown station, KHTS, AM 1220, FM 98.1. Jan Burmeister is my guest, and she, if, if you want to know about uh, top secret documents and the secret behind top secret documents, <laughs> you are going to want to stick around because Jan has been the archivist, the, the actual, the, the, handled the personal correspondence for four presidents, not one, not two, but four presidents. Welcome, Jan. Thank you. It's uh, good to be here. Why don't you uh, rattle off the presidents you, you did correspondence for? Well, I was related to correspondence or in correspondence, one way or the other. But in for President Ford, I was in the press advance office. And for President Carter, I was in the chief of staff's office, right in the West Wing there. Um, for President Reagan, I was in scheduling. For President Bush, the father, I handled his personal stuff. And then for the son, I was there a brief time in the West Wing handling his personal stuff until Homeland Security opened up, and then I went over there. So you really touched with five of the presidents over yes, over I the did. time. That's yes, I did. F fascinating. And and uh, we'll get into the personal correspondence, but let's let's start with with the dirt to begin with, and that's <laughs> the the secret documents, which of course has been on top of the news for the last few weeks, actually last yes. few months. Yes. W w and it's so frustrating because I can't get anybody to acknowledge that all of that is tracked by an office in the White House that's related to the archives, and it's called Office of Records Management. The mail that comes in, and in my day it was mostly snail mail from all over the world, from general public, it gets split three ways. One is anything official that's government business gets tracked by the Office of Records Management. They track it, they file the original, and if you want a copy of it, they put a, a blue sheet over it, and it's, it's actionable, and you have to return what action was done, and then they acknowledge that, and they file it so that when a president leaves office, all of that goes to the, to the library under the archives. So there's nothing that you can take with you that they don't already have. And you can request an original for keepsake, or if it's official business or classified, it has to be signed off by the White House Counsel's Office. The other mail, which is about 60,000 pieces a week, go to a mail reading department with about a, well, back then it was about 100 mail readers. And it was general public mail, and they would divide it into issues and questions and then disperse it to departments that would answer that mail. Uh, and then the other was personal mail, because the president has moved to 1600 Pennsylvania, and his life has changed, but his, his family has not, his friends have not. So all of that personal mail gets sent to a personal office for, for his eyes only. It doesn't go into personal records, into public records. Now, the classified documents back in those days, before mm -hmm. there was email, mm -hmm. that was tracked, but could someone in the, at the White House make a copy of that at that point? They would ask records management for a copy, and the document had a document number on it, which was on the upper right-hand corner, they would get it, the original out, send it over to the Oval Office or the General Counsel or Congressional Affairs, whoever requested it, covered by a blue sheet, and they had to send it back. And if you didn't send it back, you got a phone call from Office of Records Management saying uh, your, your document was due back here yesterday. So they were very good at tracking and managing and filing, and then when it came time to box everything up and leave the White House. I remember seeing pallets of documents sitting in the old exec office building hallways that were bundled by Office of Records Management, and it went directly to a presidential library. So why the mess now when, when you have that with former President Trump, former Vice President Pence, and of course our current President well, Joe my Biden? Fir my first guess, Carl, was that Maybe something had changed. Maybe they got a little loose, loosey-goosey with that process. So I called my old buddy, who still works in Office of Records Management, 40 years later, and he's still there, and I said, has anything changed? And then I rehearsed what I was asking about, the old process. Has anything changed? And he said no. So that told me that either someone just 
took a copy that they shouldn't have, or they didn't get permission from White House counsel. Something went awry. But again, archives should know, because when it came in first, they gave it a number. They should know what they don't have. And that's probably how they're finding out now who's got what, because somebody finally took the time to figure out what was missing. We're chatting with Jan Burmeister. She uh, worked for a number of presidents, touched hands with five of the presidents for uh, specifically handling a lot of the documents. And, and you said you don't know what's changed, but as I understand it, some of those documents go back to Joe Biden when he was senator. And, and a good chunk mm -hmm. of those documents that they found were Joe Biden when he was vice right. president. Right. So that we're, we're back some we're back a decade at least, and in some cases further than that. Correct. And I don't know how Capitol Hill handles theirs. They must have some kind of an office of records management too. Although, with senators, maybe their individual staffs are, are responsible for delivering those to the archives. That could be a completely different process that I'm not familiar with. But with the White House, it would be similar for the president right. and the vice president. And the president, vice president, correct? correct. So the documents that have been discovered when Biden was vice president, along with the documents that both Trump and Pence have had, uh, and, would and follow the, the same procedure. My frustration was that because no one was getting back to me, and I contacted some media outlets, I, could, I said, somebody's not asking the right question here. Are these originals, or are they copies that they're finding? And then also, you know, the archives has everything. So the the thought that they're gonna they've got something no one else has that they're gonna sell or give away to somebody is is just ludicrous. It's just ludicrous, and nobody's talking about that. So I'm just I'm tired of trying to get get anybody's attention, and not for my sake, but somebody should be calling Office of Records Management at the White House and getting that squared away. And trying to unravel the, <laughs> yeah. the, the 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 bit of twine right now that is is wrapped around both parties. Well, I think we're into balloons now. So, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, we were kidding before the start of this show, saying that that the only one you didn't do correspondence for was Santa Claus, <laughs> right. and that that would be a, a project as well. But how many how many documents would you say you actually? handled on a, on a given in a given year how much how many oh, would you personally handle numbers i i might have trouble putting a number on it but i can describe okay um because in addition to the personal the family and the friends that preserved their personal life somewhat um i got christmas cards from everybody including foreign countries and i'll i'll guess i'll never forget um it takes about three months after Christmas for some of the embassies to finally deliver the Christmas cards because they have to go through their embassies in Washington, D.C. And it was uh, 1991, I believe, or, yeah, uh, March, and I, I was opening the mail to send the Christmas cards over for Mrs. Bush and, and President Bush to look at. And I... This was Bush Sr., correct? Yes, okay. yes. And I ended up throwing this one on the floor to get it out of my hands. It was signed by the Ceausescus, who had just been executed two months before. And that's they had signed the Christmas card and written a little note, and then it took three months to get to our desk. Wow. Stuff like that. Bizarre. Very bizarre. And the, the presidents that, that you worked for will mention, again, in case you're just tuning in, we, we go back to Ford, Carter, Reagan, Reagan Bush, Bush, and Bush, and you had a little touch yeah. of Bush yeah. Jr. Yeah. Um, it's, before the interview, you were showing <laughs> this. I'm going to put it up here for those on Facebook. It's a, uh, a dog print. A dog print. Why don't you explain that? Okay. Well, Millie, the Bush's dog, wrote a book, and so she got... More mail than Mrs. Bush. And somebody had to answer it. Well, Mrs. Bush's office started doing that, and then I helped him out a little bit, too. And it was kids writing in, or, you know, our dogs writing in. They would, it'd be, it, was, it was crazy. Anyway, we had to answer it. So we took Millie's paw and dipped it in ink, and then cleaned it up and had a rubber stamp made from it uh, so that we could sign letters and pictures. The problem is that on pictures, a rubber stamp in, in an ink pad, it doesn't, it doesn't work. 
So I went down the hall to the FBI office and used their black roller ink, their fingerprint ink, that I would roll onto the, and then stamp it, and it worked. But then you had to have drying powder. So any given day, you'd walk into my office, and I'd have dog pictures everywhere with drying powder from the FBI office. It, was, it, it wasn't in my job description, but it sure was fun. Nowadays, those uh, pets probably have their own Facebook page and some handler <laughs> handling all the Facebook correspondence and Instagram oh, correspondence. Oh, and, and George W. and Laura's dog, Barney, used to do Barney Cam mo I mean, videos on, on YouTube. I think you can still look them up. Wow, Cute. a little bit of uh, another little piece of history. <laughs> We're talking with Jan Burmeister here on AM 1220 KHTS. Carl Goldman with you in 98.1 FM. Talking about top secret documents and the fact that Jan is a bit of history herself, having worked for five presidents for uh, doing handling their personal correspondence, and, and one of that, them, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, at least one handling the personal correspondence, but the others you certainly were attached mm -hmm. to that entire department. How do you think it's changed now that that oh. we have everything electronic? Drastically, and I don't think I could handle it now because I was in the pre-electronic age. I did build a database while I was there. I, I knew enough to do that. But to handle and answer emails that now are sent in by their mass mailed in, it's not like the 60,000 pieces of envelopes and letters that we got every week. This is hundreds of thousands that come from all over the world. I mean, it's just the volume has changed, and they still get snail mail especially from kids. I'll never forget, uh, one of my jobs was to answer questions from children. And they would write to President Bush, the father, and say, what was the color of your first car? Or what was the name of your childhood dog? Well, I had, again, pre-computer notebooks, a closet full of notebooks that had answers to almost every question anybody could ask. So, um, and, it, and it was developed by era of his life so that I could pull out his CIA or his United Nations file and answer these questions or his childhood file and answer those questions. And if I didn't have a question, I would send the letter over to the Oval Office with a note, sir, could you answer this question for me? And I'll never forget one day, uh, one came in from a um, an imaging organization, a women's health organization that asked if he had been breastfed. And I did not have the answer to that, so I sent it over. <laughs> it was, sir, <laughs> I got it back hours later, and he said, I don't remember, and I'm not going to ask my mother. <laughs> the early, I'm a, I'm a history buff, and the early presidents handled their own correspondence. I don't know how they did it, but they would take mm. two or three hours at the end of the day and answer all the mail that, that came in. Mm. And uh, I don't know when that shifted, but at some point it had to become such a, a large burden that it had to shift. Well, that was the days when you could walk up to the front door and, and ask for a visit. I mean, the volume and then the security and everything else that came with it. And then media, the media coverage. And that's the issues mail that we got from the general public every time there was a new topic, which would be education, abortion, balloons, uh, the, the flood of mail, and, and there was a whole department that would answer those. Sometimes we had to ferret those out to agencies to answer the mail and get an approved presidential response. So I think it was the volume that changed over the years, all of this, including electronics now. You mentioned mail that was divided up when it came in, and, and, you, and one category would have been foreign correspondence. How would you handle a response to that? Well, that was part of official mail that came in. Anything to do with government business, which would have been State Department and, and uh, foreign affairs. Uh, and that was tracked by Office of Records Management. And it was probably a lot of it sent over to State Department to get an answer. That's why they had to track it. They, they kept the originals. They tracked it to agencies around the government. And then they would call them. They'd put a deadline on it. We need an answer by next week. We need an answer by March the 15th. And when it didn't happen, they'd go after it. So aside from George Bush getting breastfed or not breastfed, <laughs> we are going to find out some other weird idiosyncratic 
correspondence that took place as we talk with Jan Burmeister here on your hometown <laughs> station, AM 1220 KHTS 98.1 FM. We're going to find out what the most unusual letter ever was that Jan came across right after this short break. Carl Goldman with you this Valentine's Day. Jan Burmeister is our guest. We are talking a bit of history. She worked with four, <laughs> actually five presidents, but four really closely. We're talking about Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and George Bush Sr. So uh, quite, quite a... Uh, Quite a lifetime of connections there working in the in the White House. And if you're just tuning in, we talked earlier about top secret documents. You can catch this interview, by the way, if you missed part of it, over on our YouTube channel. Also, we'll have the audio on hometownstation.com. And if you want to switch over to Facebook Live right now, we'll show pictures in a little while of Jan with the uh, the four presidents. But we were teasing coming in about really memorable correspondence that you had in, mm. in during the commercial break. Mm -hmm. You were talking about the the uh, Challenger blowing up, which is, what, 2003? Three. Three. February 1. So, it's so just we're coming up years. on the anniversary. Right. Why don't you take us back to that day? Well, I was going in, it was a Saturday, uh, to get some work done. Um, it, it was often six and seven day weeks for 12 and 14 hours a day. And I was going in to get some work done, and I heard on the radio that the uh, spaceship Columbia had exploded. Oh, it was Columbia, right? Columbia. Challenger. Challenger was right. in the 80s. It was before. Ronald Reagan. And so instead of getting any work done that day, um, we scurried around in, in the West Wing there, and I worked with the staff secretary to get a condolence letter written because he would be at their memorial service in Houston on Monday. This is Saturday. That's Monday. And he was also giving remarks in, uh, from the Oval Office that afternoon, like 5 o'clock that afternoon. So the speech writers were busy writing the remarks that had to be signed off by a whole bunch of people. And then I was tasked with writing the condolence and I seriously, it was a privilege. I prayed about it and said, God, what do these families need to hear today? And so I, I have a page that I wrote of, of things that I thought should be included. And I fashioned it into a draft and then sent it upstairs. And uh, it went through uh, four people, and they only changed about eight words. And it went out to, I had to get, I worked with NASA to get the names of all the family so that we could name them by name. Uh, and he car hand carried those letters with him that Monday to the memorial service. Wow. What? So yeah, that's a that very memorable moment. And would that me. be an example of when you might be coordinating with a speechwriter as well? I did not. Uh, they probably took a look at the letter to make sure that there was it. It kind of went along with the remarks he was giving. But both, I have I have copies of both of those to show you later. Um, that it was it was a. Uh, a day I'll never forget. And as you said uh, before the break, you, you know, you go into work planning oh. X <laughs> and something like that happens and all of a sudden your whole life has changed for... Yeah, now they the call it breaking first. news, breaking news, but then it was you get a phone call and say, you know what, the schedule's changed. And you had the schedule the day before, the president's schedule, and and knew if you were going to be involved in anything on it. And then all of a sudden, everything would change. And it could be anything. It could be uh, the one day I was supposed to go take dictation from the president, and I got the call 10 minutes before saying something had gone on in Panama. He was going to spend the whole day there, and all of a sudden, he called people into the Oval Office, and I was out of the picture, which was fine. You traveled two times with the president. What, tell us about only that. Only two. Only two. One was in, he was vice president. Which president? What, it was with Bush? Mm -hmm. okay. Vice President Bush, the father, and it was July 4 of 1988. And it was a 4th of July, so he wanted to attend as many things as he could. So I had to be at Andrews Air Force Base. It was called back then, like something like 4 a.m., some ungodly hour. And they were in Kenny Bunkport, so... Me and the photographer f were the only passengers, <laughs> and we flew on Air Force One up to Kenny Bunkport, picked up the family, and then went to four stops, including St. Louis, my hometown. So I called my parents and said, 
we're going to be down at the riverfront. At da, 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 da. So when, I, when we got off, off the, to that event, I saw my parents and waved. And then by that night, I was back home in my apartment in D.C., and I called my mom and dad and said, did I see you today? I mean, it was just a bizarre, but it was, it was a wonderful treat to be able to do that. And then when he left the office uh, and Clinton was sworn in, I was on Air Force One with them back to Houston because I was going to work down there for about 10 months to help set up the post-presidential office. What did they have you do when you were traveling with him on July 4th? You were there just in, in case. And if, if they asked for remarks, and you were taking notes, too, to feedback, um, it, it was anything that was needed. It, it was kind of a traveling secretary is what it was. And then you went to Houston right after uh, Clinton mm -hmm. took office and, mm -hmm. and were part of the planning for George Bush Sr.'s library in College Station. Well, the library is one thing, but the post-presidential <laughs> is another. And every president that leaves office gets a post-presidential office because the mail doesn't stop, the calls don't stop. And that's, you know, Boy Scouts are wanting, you know, a, a letter from former president, blah, blah. And people are still writing them. So the volume, he had an office of 11 volunteers, and they were practically full-time. Signature requests. And I tried to recreate a lot of the resources that he was going to lose by leaving the White House. He used to just pick up the phone, and the White House switchboard would put him in touch with any place in the world in minutes. And... And he still had access to, to the signal system, but we, we kept phone numbers. We kept copies of messages that he was going to get requests to write again. And, uh, and I took all of my resource books with me. So we got that all set up, and then uh, it was about 10 months it took. And then I got to work on his funeral in, tw in 2018. But then you also the, the correspondence that went back and forth, some of, the, some of that correspondence is in the library now. Yes. And some of it's in the archives, some of it's in the libraries. How does that get determined, what gets divided up between the presidential library officially and the national archives? Well, you'd almost have to ask the archivist of the United States that. But um, my best guess is practically everything that goes on during a president's administration goes to his library. And the archives of the United States has historical, like, Declaration of Independence, <laughs> and keeps the history. I'm sure that they probably decide between the two, the director of the library and the archivist, who gets what. And probably <clears throat> the, the National Archives still have, have the, the ability to pull a document from the presidential yes, library. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So they have no pun intended, the Trump over, <laughs> over, over the... Well, the library is for researchers, so that if someone wanted to write a book about George Bush or wanted to know about any any event that went on in his lifetime uh, in his in his uh, time in office they they could there's a research center down there so it's a library and a museum so the museum you want displayable material letters that he wrote to you know love letters he wrote to Barbara during the war and and maybe like like President Trump had that letter from Kim jong-un you know something something historic and interesting that would be great in a display. The Kuwait, the Gulf War, there was a, an, a vast amount of stuff that came back on a, they sent a 747 after he left office full of things. And I, I had to appraise, get it all appraised and, and that all went to the library. They even sent a door that was bigger than the door you've got here, uh, made of wood and it was a, a, a Kuwaiti custom that when when you had a wonderful guest, you you invited him and you and you gave him a door. So it, they were thanking him, and the and the edge of the door was engraved with the names of those who died in the Gulf War, which were very few, by the way. I think what we only lost 180 people or something, and uh, it was just so meaningful. And that's that's on key display down there. Well, you were down there, weren't I was you? Just down there. That's what yeah, I thought. Back in Did you see it? I don't recall that door there. But, hmm. but the, the library itself was very, very impressive hmm. to go down there yeah. and, and see that and see a bit of history. Your hometown station, AM 1220 KHTS, Carl Goldman, talking with Jan Burmeister, uh, someone who uh, worked in the Oval Office when we had five of our wonderful presidents there. Who was the most fun to work for out of the five? I would say Daddy Bush, yeah. 
yeah. They, he and Barbara were two of the finest people that ever walked the face of the earth. And, and uh, when the cameras weren't around, they were always doing things for other people. They, they spent their weekends at Camp David answering children's mail in, in, by hand. And every, everyone who lost a son or daughter in the war, he wrote a two-page handwritten letter to them. It, it was, that's how they spent their time. Yeah. And you were exposed to both Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford, and both Bushes, Bush Sr. and right, Bush Right, right. Not so much. Now, Ford was very short time because <clears throat> he right. left office quickly. <laughs> uh, and, and Reagan, I was in the vice president's office there. Um, but I, I was in touch with his staff a lot because there's a lot of interaction there. And he and President Reagan used to have lunch every Thursday. Um, and then... Carter, I was in the chief of staff's office, so yeah, and there, there's a funny story there. Um, Hamilton Jordan, do you remember? Of course. Oh, of course. Okay, I'm right, I'm right outside his office, and it's a very cold winter day. He's going to have a meeting in his office, so I thought I'd better put the fireplace on. So I went in and uh, lit the fireplace and hadn't opened the flue, so the smoke came billowing out of Hamilton's office down the hall into the Oval Office. The Secret Service came running. I mean, I never did live that down. I had to take the two pots of coffee that had just arrived and douse the fire. Um, just one, another one of those memorable moments. <laughs> that you want to forget. That you want to forget. <laughs> I'm going to show a couple of these pictures here on, on Facebook, and maybe you can share what took place with it. So we're showing... That's George uh, and George's Barbara. Yeah, so maybe you can t talk about that for a second. Oh, yeah. Well, that was taken at a Christmas party, and it was wonderful, too. They did that with the whole staff, and, and that's that's pretty much tradition. Uh, that's Jimmy Carter. This is actually a study in hairdos over the years, um, really. <laughs> um, and th this one was eight days after he was inaugurated, and he called me in and said wanted to know where his personal mail was. And I said, well, when you move to 1600 Pennsylvania, it kind of gets mixed in with uh -huh. all, all the other mail, like 60,000 pieces a week. And then, then the classic shot here of Ronald Reagan, for those listening on radio right, right now. What, what was he like to work for? Well, again, I was mostly in the vice president's office during that time. Uh, his staff was wonderful. He was so kind. He was at a lot of the the events, and he he loved the staff. He was so kind to the staff. There's the last time I saw um, President Bush in 2011. He was already in a scooter chair by then. That's George W. back in 1987. Yeah, and you can uh, check out the hairdo on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and Gerald Ford... Which was there, and then, as you said, you had a, a, a short period of time working for Gerald Ford. Where were you before uh, the working for the president? So well, before that, that job. I was with out Gerald here. Ford? I was out here in California, uh, working for Disney, and I traveled with them. I was actually on the road for two years with the Disney characters. It was called Disney on Parade, and our offices were at the NBC studios here in Burbank. Um, it was a partnership between. Disney and NBC, and they took the characters on the road and put on arena shows for, for kids all over the country. Well, I was an advanced person, so I traveled with the character. I mean, had the characters one out of every three weeks because we leap our the publicists all leapfrogged each other, and and uh, it was it was a wonderful experience. But then it closed down. The partnership dissolved, and the show closed down. So those that were running it uh, started a, a, another business that needed advanced publicists. So I ended up in Brazil putting, uh, helping put together the press material for a Brazilian musical. And it came up to the States, and I sold my car and packed up my apartment because I was supposed to be on the road for another two years. And we were in Washington, D.C., and got word that the backers in Brazil had backed out. So I had no job. The 60 performers who could hardly speak English had no way of getting back home. Some of them are still here, I think. Yeah. Um, but before I left D.C., I had dinner with some friends, and there were some White House advance people there. And they said, oh, my goodness, you know, it's, we're in the throes of the 1976 campaign. We need advance people we don't have to train. 
And I said, hello. <laughs> so I, w I went out on the road immediately for Gerald Ford. And then when Carter won, stupid me, because I was so non-political, uh, I called Jody Powell and asked if he needed an up press advance person. <laughs> I'd been out on the road with Ford. <laughs> so he laughed, and he thought that was pretty funny. But um, then I went to work for General Scowcroft for a couple of years right. before I went to the Carter White House. And so I, you went from Mickey Mouse to Gerald Ford. Correct. That's a, quite a <laughs> <Correct>. jump. <laughs> to General Scowcroft, to Jimmy Carter. So yeah, interesting. So quite a quite a checkered career there. <laughs> and then, uh, what made you? You did all those transitions, and what happened after your connection with Bush Jr.? Where did you work after that? I came home to take care of my mom and dad. Yeah, dad was in a nursing home. Tw Two thousand nine. I left Homeland Security, and uh, and Mom was living alone and shouldn't have been. So, I uh, I gave it, gave it all up and came home, and I'm still there in St. Louis, going through Mom and Dad's stuff. <laughs> so you jokingly talk about approaching Jimmy Carter's staff after being the <laughs> advance for Gerald Ford. That can never happen now. We're we're so divisive at this point. We don't have the. Well, I think everybody's much more savvy than I was. I I only got my jobs because I did what I did. I mean, I, I, I was a good publicist, and, and so I got the advanced job. Jimmy Carter, I took a typing test. My friend at the in the White House military office said, if you're going to move back to St. Louis, why don't you work at the White House just once? And she said, call Bob Anderson over in correspondence. And I called him, and he said, oh, we need people to... Back then, we had IBM memory machines. Do you remember those? I remember those. And the 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 writers that answered issues mail would put together paragraphs and so you would write in and ask three different questions and I would I would put a, a sheet of White House paper in and I would go dear Carl and then answer your three questions by pulling those paragraphs from the memory machine and we maybe got only um, 35 letters a day done but that's how it was done and so I took a typing test and typed 80 words a minute, no errors, and they hired me immediately. Well, that's the same typing pool that detailed people when it, they were needed all over the complex. And Hamilton Jordan's um, assistant secretary went on maternity leave, so I got detailed to the West Wing. That's how that happened. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> but nowadays with uh, AI, artificial intelligence, mm. you, there's the ability now to literally write mm. a customized letter to the president, from the president, to anybody to. covering any topic and do it pretty seamlessly all through artificial intelligence. Pretty scary. Yeah, it's pretty scary. And it's missing the personal touch. I mean, we changed words and we... We added things because your letter that you wrote in to me that I was answering m said a little remark, so I, I, and the president or the head of correspondence was going to sign it, depending, uh, and I would add a little something so that you knew when you got that letter back that it had been read in person by someone. Jen Burmeister is our guest here on AM 1220 KHTS 98.1 FM, your hometown station. Carl Goldman with you. We'll be back in a moment. Carl Goldman with you, KHTS, AM 1220, FM 98.1, talking with Jan Burmeister. And we were just chatting because I just returned from the Super Bowl, having uh, <laughs> having uh, weeped as the last couple of minutes mm. when the Eagles lost. But, but I do have a funny story. I wrote about this, uh, in fact, a week ago I brought it back. It goes back to the 2005 Super Bowl, the first time the Eagles were in it with uh, my friend who's the, the owner of the Eagles. And it was about 45 days after the tsunami had hit the mm. Indian Ocean, mm. which for those who don't recall that, uh, it was one of the biggest natural disasters we ever experienced yes. with uh, many, many deaths and much devastation. And what happened was the, the two president, former presidents, George Bush Sr. and Clinton, traveled together to raise private money. Uh, which was unheard of because they were uh, competing with each other in, <laughs> as uh, in the campaign, uh, and then then became close friends afterwards. Kind of like going back to the early American history with Jefferson and John Adams yes. being fierce yeah. enemies throughout their political careers, and then well, 
being close friends afterwards. And it was so Daddy Bush. I mean, he forgive forgiveness and forgetting. You know, I mean, he was a champion of that. They and they became close friends. They raised over ten million dollars yes. at the time, and and so at the beginning of the Super Bowl, they both stood on the field with giant checks. And then a few minutes later, I realized that they were right behind me in an open box and I didn't see any secret service around and the national anthem the American Beautiful is being sung by Alicia Keys Puff Daddy at the time he was called P. Diddy back then and was at the, at the height of his career he's on the field with Alicia and about two minutes later right after kickoff up walks Puff right toward me with four bodyguards bigger than the <laughs> Philadelphia Eagle front line and they end up sitting right next to me, in mm -hmm. the aisle next to me. Mm -hmm. And within about two minutes, uh, Puff turns around and sees the two presidents there. So he decides he's going to just walk right up and say uh -huh. hi to them. And I'm watching this saying, where the heck are the Secret Service? And he gets up along with the four bodyguards, and they take maybe one step. They may have been 12 steps from the presidents. They didn't get past one step no. before Secret Service were coming all over the place. As I said, it's like a scene out of Star <laughs> Trek where they were being beamed aboard from the scoreboard. They were beamed aboard from the floor, from the ceiling, and uh, they sent Puff back to his seat. <laughs> but then, then around the fourth quarter, I looked back there, and Puff was there chatting with the two presidents in the box without the bodyguards there. That's great. So that's that's they found my, out who he was. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's my story. That's but great. you have a, you have quite a story about the funeral for for Bush. Yes, uh, uh, so privileged, and it, it it was December of of 2018, and he died on November 30th. It was a Friday. Um, but it wasn't the first time he had almost passed away. Um, 2017, he, he had a really bad bronchial bout. And uh, those of us who were going to help with, we had volunteered four years before to help out when the time came, when that bad day came. And so I almost was asked to come several times before that. But it was 2018, and he, uh, Linda, his secretary, called me the night before, and she said, yeah, Bob, we think this is probably it, so get on down here. And I uh, packed, I, I actually had my bags packed um, for a year. And there were two scenarios. One was, would he die in Kenny Bunkport or would he die in Houston? And there was a plan different for each. So it was Houston, and, and we knew that plan, and we had had conference calls about it, because you don't start planning when it happens you have to and actually one of the last things a president does before he leaves the white house is to meet with the military district of washington who's in charge of the state funeral and they ask you know where do you want funerals and what do you want done and they they iron all that out so that it's it's in the planning stages and then there's media and then there's security and look the two big hotels had to be emptied in Washington, D.C., to make room for all of the international visitors that came in for that. So it's lots of moving parts. And so it had been, there were over 200 people working on it, four years, a state funeral. Um, but I, um, I got down there the morning after he died, and they had already sent out 7,000 emails to invite people to various funeral events. And it was our job to follow up on those invitations to make sure everybody got them. And uh, um, a lot of them said, no, I didn't. And uh, they thought they hadn't been invited to their one of their good friend's funerals. I mean, Tommy Lasorda was one of them. And I, I said, check your spam box. And sure enough, because it had gone out in mass, it was that's where it was. So we would stay on the phone with them, make sure, because it had to be electronically RSVP'd. So you had a scan that would get you into the security and then the funeral. And we would stay on the phone until all of that was done, and they actually had in hand the copy of their scan. So How old was President Bush at the time he passed away? 94. 94. Yeah. yeah. And you're here now in Los Angeles today. We're lucky, privileged enough to have you here in Santa Clarita. What, what brings you to L.A.? Uh, another memorial service, yeah. Uh, I, I've been, I, I'm just so awed to have worked for such tremendous men and Bush was one, General Scowcroft was another, but one of one of uh, the biggest in influences of my life was Pastor Jack Hayford, and he was pastor of Church on the Way here in Van Nuys. And when I lost my job, uh, when 
Bush and Reagan came in at, at first, he was in town and he said, the Lord's been telling me to start a radio television ministry. Would you come out? And I said, mm, uh, it's a little far away from my parents for me, but um, I'll, I'll see. And he said, well, let's pray about it, which is a very dangerous thing to do. And so we set a date of March 30, and if I hadn't gotten my White House job back by then, I was to call him. March 30, Ronald Reagan was shot. And I thought to myself, is Ronald Reagan going to die and Bush is going to get in and I know all these Bush people, I'm going to get my job back. And it was, no, God doesn't kill presidents so you can work where you want to work. That's not the way this works. So <laughs> so I called Jack Hayford on March 30 and uh, said I'll be out there. And we spent four years developing his radio program, which was just sustaining time for the first couple of years, and then it developed into 300 stations. But that four years, I sat under his Bible teaching, and he, he was not only a prolific music writer, he wrote Majesty, I don't know if you've ever heard that song, okay. Um, but he was just an in-depth Bible teacher and changed my life. So he, he passed away uh, in, in January, and his, his memorial service is this Saturday. And we have a couple of offshoot, offshoots of Church on the Way here in Santa Clarita Yes, now, you too. do. Yes, you do. Several. Yeah. So it's expanded there. Jan Burmeister is our guest here on AM 1220 KHTS. Carl Goldman with you, talking, reminiscing about uh, a, a lot of American history, the four presidents that Jan worked for and the connection with George Bush Jr., but the four presidents, uh, Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter, and George Bush Sr. And uh, and what a what a delight to have you here and just Thank share you. that. Thanks that for inviting bit of time me. Time yeah, with you. That's great. When you know, we talked about uh, adversaries and and the fact I was talking about how Clinton and and Bush yes. Sr. became friends long afterwards. It's really a, a small club, and and really going back in time with history. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, our second and third yes. president, were horrible enemies yes. over the years and did did some things that if, if we tried to do it today, even with some of the stuff that's being done today, it would seem like child's play compared to what they, they did historically back then to mm -hmm. each other. And yet they both uh, became close friends afterwards and, and kept up a correspondence till the the day that both of them died on July 4th together at the same time. I remember that. In different states. Reading that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so I, I guess my question to you is, is, do you see that ever happening again? Do you think we can come together uh, enough uh, to... to um, well, I don't know. Um, George Bush, the father and his son, uh, but his father was such a man of character. I even, the time I worked for him, wrote down the things that he seemed to live by. And one was be slow to judge and quick to forgive, keep a sense of humor, never forget the little guy, always be thankful, always be grateful for your freedom. I mean, it, it was, I don't know that, I don't know that I could write that about too many of the, the world leaders today. And that's what it took. Um, but no, uh, I remember Bill Clinton talked about him as the father I never had. And it, it just made such perfect sense that he would reach out to Bill Clinton. It's something, it, it was not a shock. It was not a surprise at all. Maybe it'll take a crisis because we go, go back in, in mm. time and, and think of Roosevelt and Churchill and, and there, mm -hmm. there are other combinations too where a crisis may bring two strong mm -hmm. personalities together who have very differing views and yet the, the crisis itself brings them well, together. forgiveness, uh, I'll never forget when he wrote uh, his trip to Hirohito's funeral. He said he sat there in the front row and looked at the coffin and remembered he had been shot down in World War II and almost died. And he said he sat there and felt in his heart for the first time he could forgive this, this little old man. And um, it, it was just another thing that didn't surprise me. So, when, One last question before we run out of time. We're here in, in Santa Clarita, and Ronald Reagan's library is close by. And I, I mm. feel, having been to most of the libraries now, it's, it's probably the best and the most exciting to go and visit. Did you have any part in that? And have you visited it first? Of I all? have visited that. No, uh, no. And the and the libraries are mostly done by the archives. Yeah. So um, I I packaged up a lot of things for them, remembering that. Uh, one other thing that I remember George W. saying was that um, 
World War II and remembering what his father had said about that. And he said, now the prime minister of Japan is one of my best friends. Who would have, said, who would have thought that back in 1944, 45? Right. So there's hope. There's a lot of hope. And with that, we'll sign off here on your hometown station. Jan Burmeister has been my guest. Best of luck to you. Thank and we we'll look forward to uh, more exciting things on, on your <laughs> end. Carl Goldman with you on your hometown station, AM 1220 KHTS. If you caught just part of this interview, you can check it out on our YouTube channel, the KHTS YouTube channel will be put up in about a day from now. And uh, also it's on as an audio on hometownstation.com. All of you have a great, great Valentine's Mm. Day. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody.